Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Jessel Norm Baltimore. WikiLeaks has finally released its long-awaited trove of Clinton emails that it promised to be a bombshell or October surprise that could shake the presidential race. Well, the emails quite haven't lived up to that, but they, along with Hillary Clinton's Wall Street speeches, leaked by hackers Guccifer 2.0 and DC leaks, do give us a candid look at Hillary Clinton and, her, and their close advisors when they're not in the public eye. On Tuesday, the chairman of Democrat Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, John Podesta, said the FBI is investigating the hack of his emails published on WikiLeaks. Speaking to reporters ab aboard a campaign plane, Podesta said the FBI probe is a part of a broader investigation into the hacking of Democratic computers. I've been contacted by the FBI. They are investigating the matter. Uh, it is a, you know, it is a, um, uh, a criminal breach uh, under our federal statutes to hack into my private email account. And uh, we're, uh, uh, but beyond that, I don't know the circumstances other than uh, we did hear from law enforcement authorities uh, that they confirmed that it was part of the ongoing investigation of, of Russian uh, uh, hacking into, the, uh, into democratic organizations. Well, now joining us to discuss this is Zed Jelani. He's a reporter for The Intercept, previously worked as a reporter and blogger for Think Progress, United Republic, the Progressive Change, Change Cam uh, Campaign Committee, and Alternet. Thanks so much for joining us. It's great to be here. So it doesn't look like these leaks are going to change the presidential election, although perhaps they might have changed the primary against Bernie Sanders if they were released this spring. Um, both Clinton and Podesta have pointed the finger at the Russians. Meanwhile, publications like The Atlantic and The Washington Post say these leaks just affirm what we already know about Hillary Clinton, that she's a pragmatic politician. Um, give us your overall response to what these leaks uh, can teach us about Hillary Clinton. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the leaks, uh, you know, it's basically a dump of a person of a campaign email address, basically John Podesta's personal email, which he was using um, for the Hillary Clinton uh, 2016 presidential campaign. So we got all sorts of information. I mean, there's everything from recipes that you know he he was uh, planning in terms of the cooking he was doing, to actually uh, some really great insight into sort of the mindset that the Clinton campaign had in, ador in addressing multiple issues, as well as a little bit of a peek into the uh, long-sought issue of her paid speech transcripts. You know, Hillary Clinton made millions of dollars in giving paid speeches primarily to private corporations or public corporations uh, in private speeches since leaving her office, sec office as Secretary of State. And until now, we haven't seen excerpts of any of those speeches that she gave despite asking her. Um, her campaign never produced those, but within these hacked emails, we do see excerpts that they prepared um, in response to inquiry actually from us. You know, they, they prepared these excerpts two days after we had approached Clinton and asked her in person about these transcripts. Um, and so for the first time, we got a, a look at a lot of what she was saying in these page speech transcripts, which is just pretty interesting. And so that earned you and your colleague Lee Fang some ire from um, the uh, Clinton, the Clinton campaign, and people close to her. Um, they were really upset that you were asking about this. Um, but it's it's interesting because in those speeches, you know, she gave some more corporate positions. Um, she sort of promised to champion Wall Street. She she sort of spoke out against the Dodd Frank um, reforms. She said Wall Street needs to regulate itself. Um, can you comment about that? At the same time, she also praised single payer um, in the form it's it's uh, been in place in Canada as well. So, which is which she's been publicly against. She's taken a more seems like she's taken a more conservative approach publicly than in private. Yeah. So I think uh, probably the most revelatory thing about these speeches were things that she was saying that were dissonant with what she was saying in public during her campaign. So as you mentioned. Uh, she had mentioned some of the benefits of establishing a, a single-payer national health care program, which is something that she campaigned very vigorously against, against Bernie Sanders, you know, denouncing his plan as, you know, something that would dismantle American health care as we know it. Uh, but she also, I think, took a different tact on, for example, some financial issues. For example, she had mentioned that uh, in some of her speeches, I believe at Morgan Stanley, she had praised the uh, Simpson-Bowles plan, which was a deficit reduction, reduction plan that was put together. Uh, by, by a bipartisan commission a few years ago that would actually reduce Social Security benefits. It would cut the corporate and individual uh, income tax rates. 
And that is something that she never did during her campaign. During her campaign, she said she would protect Social Security, she would expand Social Security benefits. So I think, yeah, we, what we saw in these speeches was sort of a different side to her, you know, something that she was playing more to the audiences that she was talking to at that time. And I think a lot of those audiences wanted to hear that. Now, does that mean that what she said in these speeches is the truth and what she said on the campaign trail, you know, that wasn't true? I don't think that's necessarily true. It's more that, you know, she showed that she's willing to say one thing to one group of people and another thing to another group of people so that we're not entirely sure, you know, what she actually believes or what she will advocate for. And I think, you know, a lot of people can say that this is a very typical politician thing to do, so on and so forth. And, you know, that may be the case with a lot of politicians, but we still have to have the evidence to prove it. And I think that's a lot of what this provided. And, uh, you know, from, from the leaks, we also learned that Wall Street donors complained about Elizabeth Warren's influence. And what uh, we also learned what trade unions were asking for. And this was specifically to the committee um, for the, the Democratic House membership that, that fundraises for them. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, there were a series of, of hacks um, that resulted in leaked uh, emails and leaked documents. And one of the other related hacks uh, was of the DCCC, which is sort of the fundraising arm of the House Demo Democrats, and they're, they're sort of, uh, you know, every two-year campaign cycle. And part of what we found in that was there were sort of meeting notes, um, uh, notes taken of meetings between the head of the DCCC it was a congressman out west, uh, Ben Lugin, um, and various interest groups. So he met with Goldman Sachs, with General Electric, various labor unions, with a financial uh, interest group called SIFMA, and basically heard them out and heard their concerns out. And, and it was really interesting. A lot of uh, what the, especially the banks were complaining about, was Elizabeth Warren. They really didn't like Elizabeth Warren and what she was saying, what she was doing. And at one point, the head of the DCCC even shows them a news article saying, hey, she doesn't speak for us, you know, trying to kind of throw her, her under the bus to try to appease them. And it's interesting, you know, I think that a lot of what that shows is, you know, just what, you know, what is it that donors seek when they think about contributing to the DCCC? I mean, all these people that they met with were donors. They had all given, I think, no less than five figures within the last campaign cycle. Um, so, it, you know, it shows you how money buys access, and then with access, this is what you do with it. You ask for various messaging items, you ask for policy items, and if they don't give it to you, they're not going to, you know, they may not want to give you money. For example, SIFMA, the, which were the financial lobbyists, told the DCCC that they, didn't, they really didn't like the messaging uh, around financial issues that they couldn't contribute at that time. I mean, it, that's a very blatant example of what an interest group wants, and if they don't get it, they're not going to give you money. Um, this is something that I think a lot of people intuitively understand happens, but we often don't get the details as to how it happens, and I think that's really important. And finally, um, in part of the report that was uh, made for you, that was leaked, um, I guess made in response to some of your questions, um, it also discussed um, a part in her in a Goldman Sachs speech where she talked about how a no-fly zone, which she has supported publicly, including in um, Sunday's debate, it would kill, she acknowledged it will kill a lot of Syrians and that it would not be easy to implement this um, in Syria. She talked about some of the dangers, especially for Syrian civilians. She said a lot of civilians are going to die trying to take out these air defenses, which she hasn't been as public about. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, I think it's really interesting in the sense that she has, in terms of her public statements, always been in favor of either some kind of no-fly zone, a safe zone, which would require ground troops. Um, to basically intervene in Syrian civil war to try to create a safe territory for civilians would require directly, um, directly combating, or at least threatening to combat the Syrian military as well as now the Russian military. And I think that, you know, she's never, at least in public, evinced any level of skepticism about that plan. However, in this speech, she, she even referred to people who were proposing this plan as glib and saying that, you know, it's actually very complicated because of how, the geography of Syria and sort of the nature of what a military intervention to establish a no-fly zone would entail. And I think it's really fascinating that the only skepticism we've seen from her was in a paid speech, in a private speech that she didn't, you know, want to make public, you know. And the question is, you know, did she change her mind since then? Is the position she's establishing now more of a political position and that she actually understands all the drawbacks of doing this? I mean, I think it raises a lot of interesting questions, and it's, it's really up to Clinton to sort of explain that to people, because I think a lot of the objections that she raised within that speech were common objections that still apply now and that people would still utilize now to talk about a lot of the drawbacks of, of using a policy like a no-fly zone in Syria.
And I wanted to get your, your rea re response and reaction to Clinton and Podesta, um, you know, sort of not wanting to s discuss the content of these, of these leaks, but saying the Russians are behind it. Um, and, you know, others have said that uh, the Russians are manipulating these leaks, they're, they're changing the content of, of some of the leaks, and they, you know, their goal is to um, influence the, the presidential race to take down Hillary Clinton. Um, how do you respond to allegations like that? Well, I mean, I think what's interesting is that initially, when the latest round of leaks related to Podesta's email, um, latest round of hacks related to Podesta's email were released, we saw that messaging from a lot of Democrats, including Tim Kaine, the vice presidential nominee, was saying that they can't verify the authenticity, and that's what the campaign's official line is. However, they've never pointed to any specific email or leak and said that that was false. Um, and in, in fact, Clinton was asked about a specific uh, part, a transcript of some of her paid speeches during the town hall on Sunday, and she did seem to confirm its authenticity. So. You know, I think largely their response has been very political. I mean, they're trying to figure out a way just to attack the messenger and not to discuss the content of uh, the material within, which I think is a very different thing than understanding the truth of what really happened, which I think is an interesting question, but we don't really have all the facts to, to answer that question yet. All right. Well, Zed Jelani, thanks so much for joining us. We're going to link to all of your reporting at therealnews.com. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us at The Real News Network.